Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this second of IT Governance webinar series of the European Union General Data Protection Regulation. My name is Adrian Ross, and I will be your host for the next 40 to 45 minutes, uh, which we've scheduled for this. Um, so I'm expecting to last about 40 to 45 minutes, and at the end of which there will be an opportunity for each of you to ask questions. Also, I'd like to say at this stage that uh, our excellent support team will be sending out a copy, a copy of the email and slides tomorrow, about 10 a.m., um, so you can expect that in your inbox. Um, and then just to start talking about the EU GDPR and data breaches. Before we begin, I'd just like to say a few words about myself, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Adrian Ross. I'm a GRC consultant with IT governance. Uh, my background is, I guess, over 30 years in IT business, uh, IT industry and general business. I think way back in the 80s, I was involved in infrastructure services in the banking and finance sector in the City of London. Um, I had opportunities after that to be involved in business process re-engineering. Uh, so that, at that time, that was downsizing, right-sizing, uh, zero-based budgeting of some fairly well-known organizations in Europe. Uh, from there, I moved on to join a startup organization that specialized in business intelligence. And some of you will probably remember that time uh, in terms such as data warehousing. Uh, I did that all across Europe, so I have experience of working in every country in Europe, Scandinavia, and after which I then started to get involved higher up the, the food chain, if you like, doing things like business architecture, uh, designing businesses to, for uh, startup um, modes, and then looking at uh, you know downsizing, consolidation, and really designing businesses to achieve maximum benefits. Around about 2002, I had an opportunity to produce a children's television series for the British Broadcasting Corporation, otherwise known as the BBC, and that led me into the field of intellectual property uh, in the media sector. Uh, over the previous 20 years, of course, I had been doing intellectual property, working with some of the um, most high technology organizations in the world. And from from the intellectual property and the media sector, I then went on to do a lot of work in legal compliance for corporate organizations, looking at governance from the board right down to operations. And that led me to become involved with IT governance. Um, similarly, uh, I could then got into data protection, which we're going to talk about today, and information security. And more latterly, over the last couple of years, I've been doing quite a bit of work uh, in the enterprise risk management sector. So I guess one of the great things about working for IT governance is that we have a very diverse range of clients. Um, a lot of our clients work in the um, high-tech sector, so intellectual property. And, um, and I, I will give one example being on the Cambridge Business Park, uh, an organization we work with who are uh, in genome medical, biomedical science. So that's one of the attractions. If you look at the slide on your screen now, you can see that IT governance has a number of strings to the bow. Um, so at the very top, I work for the governance risk and compliance group, um, which looks over cyber resilience, again, governance risk management, and we talk to organizations at every level about the importance of governance. Uh, we have a large presence in information security, uh, ISO 27001. Uh, business continuity is another one of our skill areas. Um, our consultants have a great deal of experience over IT governance, service management, project management, a uh, number of them are skilled in PRINCE2, ITIL, COBIT, and then we also do quite a bit in cyber, cyber security, PCI DSS, penetration testing, data protection, consultancy and certification. So 
as it says there, we have our clients are in all verticals, all sectors, and all organizational areas. So the agenda for today is to begin with, with an overview of the regulatory landscape. I'm going to talk about the laws that are applicable in Europe, how they work. We're going to look at the territorial scope of the GDPR. Then we're going to talk about, quite up front, talk about remedies, liabilities and penalties. We're going to then move on to the principles of the EU GDPR, talk about data breaches, notification rules, supervisory authorities and the formation of the new European Union Data Protection Board. So when we talk about European law, there are in the main two types. There are what we call directives and when a directive is passed it requires individual implementation in each of the member states of the European Union. Um, the last directive that was implemented, as you can see there on the slide, was European Directive 95-46-EC. Now that was, I think, 21 years ago was the last implementation of a directive that related to data protection. That then resulted in the implementation of the UK Data Protection Act in 1998. And the advantage of having a directive is that it's quick and easy to implement. Its passage through the European Parliament is relatively quick. Um, the disadvantage is that you end up with 28 member states who have implemented their own legislation and that ends up with 28 variations of data protection laws. Now for a big multinational organisation operating in Europe, that means that they have to be aware of the variances between the member states, the variances in the law between the member states. The other type of legislation that we're going to talk about today is the General Data Protection Regulation. And note that it is a regulation. And regulation is designed to be uniform across the 28 member states. So when the regulation becomes law, it is immediately applicable in each of the member states. There is no requirement for each member state to then implement its own legislation. As I say, the EU GDPR is a regulation, so when that goes live, it is applicable across all the 28 member states. Now, one thing I should say at this stage is that <clears throat> that is the theory of regulations. I think once you get into the detail of the GDPR, there are a number of what they call derogations, which are exceptions, uh, and I think there's over 40, as I counted, um, where each of the member states can finely tune the, their implementation of the GDPR. So one such example can be uh, the age of a child. It's currently set in the regulation at 16 years old, but each member state can vary that age down to 13 but no lower uh, and in that band range. Uh, the other, another example I would give is the definition of large scale data processing. That is left to each member state to define what is meant by that. So there are a number of, uh, as I say, derogations where each member state can finely tune the regulation, but the principle of regulation is that it's the same across the 28 member states. Article 99 of the GDPR is the article that brings the, the regulation into force and its application. It says there it's binding in its entirety and directly applicable. The key dates are, or were rather, the 8th of April where the Council adopted the regulation. On the 14th of April it was adopted by the European Parliament. On the 4th of May, it's published in the official journal of the European Union. That is a statutory stage that it has to go through. 
It entered force on the 24th of May 2016 and becomes law on two years after that date and you'll note there is a difference between the 24th and 25th. How it actually works is the clock ticks to midnight on the 24th and when it hits midnight the directive that was in force previously falls away and one minute or one second past midnight the regulation applies. You can obtain a uh, a text of the directive with the link enclosed on the slide. Now, the GDPR has 11 chapters within the regulation. Chapter 1 talks about the general provisions and we'll talk about those in a moment. Uh, chapter 2 is not unlike the Data Protection Directive that preceded the, the regulation some years that was implemented in 95. Talks about principles and some of those principles remain the same. Chapter 3 talks about the rights of the data subject and as you can see covers articles 12 to 23. Chapter 4, which we'll talk about today, uh, talks about controllers and processors. And chapter 5, the transfer of data between uh, third countries and international organizations and what I'd like to say is that over chapters 1 to 5 is pretty much the substantive areas of the regulation. Chapter 6 independent supervisory authorities uh, and 7 there where you see cooperation and consistency they are chapters that talk about the actual working of the regulation rather than the substantive pieces of law. Chapter 8 goes on to talk about remedies, liabilities and penalties which is very important. There are substantial remedies, uh, substantial penalties for organization that breaches the regulation and different parts. Um, one part of it talks about 2% of worldwide turnover, other part talks about 4% of worldwide turnover for organizations in the preceding year. So what that means is the preceding year's financial results will have been published so the European Court um, or the Supervisory Authority can easily identify the value of the organization and then apply the penalties against the preceding year's turnover. And then Chapter 9 just talks about the relatively or relating to specific processing situations, but as I say, the substantive chapters are 1 to 5. So when we look at the a pictorial representation of the data protection model under the GDPR, there are a number of actors, if you like, and this pretty much, this slide talks about the pretty much the structure of how it works. At the very top there we have a new organization called the European Data Protection Board. Um, that sits above what is called a supervisory authority. Now each member state will have at least one supervisory authority but can have more than one. But only one can be classified as a lead supervising authority. At the moment in the United Kingdom that position is held by the Information Commissioner's Office. Um, but as I say you can have more than one and I think the, the idea is that you may have uh, supervisory authorities that specialize in different areas but as I say one can only be lead and only one can communicate with the European Data Protection Board. Um, as you can see from the arrow the supervisory authority's role is essentially assessment and enforcement of data controllers. Um, under the directive preceded the regulation it was pretty much focused on the relationship between supervisory or what was what used to be known as the Data Protection Authority in the UK is now the Information Commissioners Officers. That title is now revised to be to be Supervisory Authority. And under the old directive, the role was pretty much about assessment and enforcement with the data controller. Under the GDPR, that also covers the data processor. So the data processor is now brought into scope as someone that the supervisory authority can make assessments and enforcements over. As you can see the, to the right of that slide we have a box called the data subject. 
uh, which we call individuals, but we'll talk about shortly as being, uh, well, essentially what we call natural persons, human beings. So those data subjects have rights, um, and that the data controller and the data processor have duties to the data subject. Similarly, the, there are third parties. Uh, third party could be, for instance, two data subjects who perhaps at one stage uh, entered into a joint contract with, for instance, a tenancy agreement, and then one party, one data subject contacts the controller to get that tenancy agreement. And then the data controller has to take into consideration uh, the disclosure elements with the third party. You know, do, do they have to, given the information that's requested, do they have to notify the third party? And then over on the left, there is uh, third countries where data can be transferred to uh, within the scope of the GDPR as well. And guarantees have to be made based on the rights of the data subjects. Articles 1 to 3, they talk about who and where the law is applicable. As I said on the previous slide, a natural person, which is defined in the Act, is a living individual in the European Union. So there's roughly speaking about 500 million of those, and that's, that's different from, for instance, a legal person. Legal person being a company, a limited liability partnership, or any uh, corporate vehicle that would trade. What we're talking about here is the rights of living individuals in the European Union. Uh, they have rights associated with the protection of personal data, uh, more specifically personally identifiable data, so where you can tie personal data to an, indiv an individual, they have rights associated with that. Um, they have new rights under the GDPR regarding the processing of personal data. And also within the regulation, it talks about the unrestricted movement of personal data within the European Union. Now, for those of us who are Europeans, we have been used to, for a number of years, the freedom of movement of people in the European Union, and the regulation brings in this definition of freedom of movement of personal data. So those 500 million people, their data can move around the European Union without restriction. Um, what's in material scope is personal data that is processed wholly or partly by automated means, um, and personal data that is part of a filing system or intended to be. Now, within that particular part of the regulation, it doesn't have to be electronic, it can be paper-based. Uh, if it's indexed, it constitutes a filing system. The regulation applies to controllers and processors irrespective of where the processing takes place, and also applies to controllers in the EU. And I tend to think those last two points um, are moot points in a sense, because really the regulation is about data subjects in the European Union and personal data. So any organization, wherever they are, that processes personal data of European Union citizens are subject to this regulation. Remedies, liabilities and penalties. Article 79 states that the data subject has a right to an effective judicial remedy against a controller or processor. As I said earlier, under the old directive, it was just the controller. Well, now it's also the processor. And in fact, when you get down into the detail of the regulation, there is what's called joint and several liability between both of them. Um, the judicial remedy is applicable where the data subject rights have been infringed as a result of processing of personal data. Um, and where that has happened is where the controller or processor has an establishment or in the courts of the member state where the data subject habitually resides. There's also another couple of conditions there that they can uh, raise an action where the processing took place now, Article 82, right to compensation and liability, any person that suffered material or non-material damage. 
will have the right to compensation from the controller or the processor. The controller's liability is limited to the damage caused by processing. Similarly, with the processor, it's, lim it's limited to the damage caused by processing. So the data subject has the option to sue both of them or sue one of them for processing or sue one of them for controlling. Article 83, general conditions for imposing administrative fines. The idea amongst the, uh, the regulation set within the regulation is that fines will be effective, proportionate and dissuasive. That means that the, uh, the, uh, the courts intend the fines to be taken seriously and within the regulation it specifies they will take into account technical and organisational measures implemented. Now this is talked about quite a lot in the regulation but there is a big onus on controllers and processors to adopt the appropriate technical and organisational measures to protect the rights of the data subjects. Now there is the 4% fine, 20 million euros, or in the case of an undertaking which is an organisation, 4% total worldwide annual turnover in the preceding year. Now those of us who have been in industry for a while will know that 4% fine of total worldwide turnover for a retail organisation is their whole margin. So that's pretty substantial fines. Article 5 talks about the principles and the principles of personal data that need to be adhered to. Data has to be processed lawfully, fairly and in a transparent manner. It, has, it can only be collected for specified, explicit and legitimate purposes. So you cannot say you're going to collect data for one purpose and then collect it for another purpose. Um, when they talk about explicit, we talk about the explicit consent of the data subject for their data to be used. Under the regulation, under the directive, um, it was implied. So within the regulation, consent has to be explicit. The data collected has to be adequate, relevant and limited to what is necessary for the processing. It has to be accurate and where necessary kept up to date. Uh, there are time constraints for how long it can be retained and it has to be processed in an appropriate manner to maintain security. The regulation brings in this new principle of accountability and accountability is broadly defined as applying the previous six principles of having been seen to do so. Article 5 and 6 talk about lawfulness and there's an obligation on the controller and processor to be secure against accidental loss, destruction or damage of data subjects, personally identifiable information. The processing must be lawful which means amongst other things the data subject must give their consent and even more so when the consent is child consent, it requires parental consent or custodial consent, the person who is looking after the child. There are specific circumstances where consent is not required and that is exceptions where the controller has to under, undertake processing to comply with legal obligations of their own. The time to respond to subject access requests has been reduced down to one month and the charges that were previously in place with the Directive and the Data Protection Act for the United Kingdom have been abolished. Now, having said that, they, they can still apply charges, the controller can still ask apply charges to the subject access request, request if it is a vexatious claim. That is to say that somebody phones up making claims that are without foundation. So, but in the main, the charges are abolished. And under the new regulation, controllers and process are clearly distinguished from one another, clearly identified obligations, 
controllers responsible for ensuring processors comply with contractual terms. So now there must be clearly identify uh, legal obligations between the controller and the processor, usually by terms of contract. Um, processors must operate under a legally binding contract. Article 32 is the one that talks in the main about the security of personal data. Um, and there is a requirement on data controllers and data processors to implement a level of security appropriate to the risk. Now, there are a number of techniques that the regulation talks about. Pseudonymization is one of them, and that is where you can hold data in separate locations, which by virtue of the fact they are held in separate locations mean that the data subject cannot be identified from the data. Uh, encryption is another technique that is used within this uh, along with something called minimization and minimization is simply just collecting the data that is applicable to the service that the data subject has agreed to take from the controller and limiting, limiting it to that. There is a, a security requirement to ensure confidentiality, integrity and availability of the systems. Um, a process required for regularly testing, assessing and evaluating the effectiveness of the security measures. Um, security measures taken, taken need to comply with the concept of privacy by design. Now what privacy by design is about is designing systems from the outset that encapsulate the security measures of the data subjects. Okay, so when we look at cyber breaches within United Kingdom, 69% of large organizations suffered cyber breaches in 2015. 38% of small organizations. The median of cyber on breaches per company, large organizations were 14, small organizations four. The cost, the average cost of the worst single breach for a large organization was 1.46 million to 3.14 million. Small organizations roughly between 75,000 and 311,000 pounds. What's going to happen going forward? Well, roughly 60% of respondents expect more breaches this year than last. 60% of breach small organizations closed down within six months. When we look at the types of breaches, externally attacks were 69%, malware or viruses 84%, denial of service was 37%, and network penetration was 37%. And what we find within IT governance is that quite a lot of organizations have been breached but don't know they've been breached. When we talk to companies about whether or not they've suffered IP theft, roughly 19% know that they have. Uh, presumably there's a, a percentage on top of that organization that have had IP theft but don't know they've had it. Staff related security breaches are currently about 75%. Inadvertent human error are running at 50%. And when we look at the cybercrime, the top 20 countries in the world, we can see the United States is up there with 23% and various countries throughout the world with their allocation. So what does the breach landscape look like? Well, in our experience, it's not a case of if you're going to be breached, it's more a case of when. The key to dealing with breaches is to be prepared, develop the resilience to respond, don't wait until after the event because within the UGTPR there is a 72 hour window where 
the data processor has to notify the data controller of any and every breach. The data controller has to notify the supervisory authority within 72 hours. And if they don't, they then have to give reasons why. And any fines that are imposed um, take into account the 72 hour window. How and when did the organization respond to the supervisory authority? And in terms of fines, this counts towards mitigation. So if the organization hasn't responded, um, doesn't look as good as though as one that has responded within 72 hours and started to work with the supervisory authority. Incident response management is mandated within the well-known standards of ISO 27001, 22301, and PCI DSS. When we look at the phases of a cyber attack, stage one is typically reconnaissance by the, the assailant, identifying the target, looking for vulnerabilities. Stage two, is exploiting vulnerabilities, defeat the remaining controls. Stage three is disruption of systems, extraction of data, manipulation of information. When we look at the top 10 challenges facing organizations in relation to cyber security incidents, and particularly sophisticated cyber security attacks, identification of suspected cyber security incident is, is number one. As I said earlier, in our experience, quite a lot of organizations don't even know they've been breached. Secondly, is establishing the objectives of an investigation and the cleanup operation, analyzing the available information related to cyber, potential cybersecurity incident, determining what has actually happened, what systems, networks, and information assets have been compromised, because those tend not to be immediately visible, what information has been disclosed to unauthorized third parties, stolen, deleted or corrupted, finding out who did it and why, that is often uh, very important. Was the, was the assailant doing it for money or were they doing it to ruin reputation? Um, we have an example of a, a, a well-known organization in the United Kingdom um, that suffered a cyber security breach and the story or the press release from the organization was that it was only 156,000 customers that were affected. Uh, that was personal details, name, address, bank details. Ultimately, in the following year, that telecommunications company the profits plunged about 55% and they had to make a 38 million pound provision in the accounts to fix the damage. Um, next is working out how it happened determining the potential business impact of the cybersecurity incident and conducting forensic investigation to identify those who were responsible. CREST, as you can see there, is an approved accreditation body under the UK government cyber essential scheme. CREST were engaged by CESG, the information security arm of GCHQ to come up with a cyber incident response approach. First stage is prepare, conduct a critical criticality assessment, carry out cyber security threat analysis, consider the implications of people, process, technology and information, create an appropriate control framework through using something like ISO 27001, Review your state of readiness in cybersecurity incident response. Second stage is to respond 
identify cybersecurity incidents, define the objectives, investi investigate the situation, take appropriate action, recover systems, data, and connectivity. And third and final stage is the follow-up. Investigate the incident more thoroughly. I think this is, for those of us who have been around for a while, is possibly like a, a post-implementation review and, and looking, you know, with the benefit of hindsight to see how things have been could have been done better. Uh, reporting of incident to relevant stakeholders, very part because stakeholders have their own reputation to 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 think about. Carry out post-incident review, communicate and build on lessons learned update key information, controls and processes, and perform trend analysis. So utilizing the Crest Cyber Incident Response Approach and drawing on our experience in 27001 and 27035 standards, this is a lot of the stuff that we actually do. Help organizations to implement an effective prepare, respond and follow up incident response approach in line with Crest. Article 33 of the GDPR talks about personal data breaches, defines a personal data breach means a breach of security leading to accidental and lawful destruction, loss, alteration, unauthorized disclosure of or access to personal data transmitted, stored or otherwise processed. As I said earlier, any data breach that the processor is aware of, they must, without exception, notify the data controller. It says they are notification without undue delay after becoming aware. Uh, the regulation talks about the 72 hour period, but the reason that we have that in there is undue delay is one of these terms in the GDPR that is not clearly defined, um, but there is a, an obligation um, on the Data Protection Board uh, to define that as they go forward, as this regulation goes forward. As I say, there are no exemptions. All data breaches have to be reported by the processor to the controller. There's an obligation on data controller to notify the supervisory authority, as I've said, without undue delay and not later than 72 hours. There are certain circumstances where it is unnecessary and this is to do with whether or not the data that's been breached is, is, could be termed as being high risk. If it's deemed to be not to be high risk, i.e. it's not personal, uh, intensely personal information, and when they talk about personal information, we're talking about sexual orientation, we're talking about gender, health data, um, the trade union membership is in there. Um, a, a decision has to be taken at whether it is high risk data and I would suggest that health data would almost certainly be high risk. Um, when the controller notifies the supervisory authority, they're required to give a description of the nature of the breach. That means they have to specify the categories of data subjects is it male, female, children, adults, patients, pupils, the number of data subjects concerned, the number of personal records that have been breached. They also have to give a description of the likely consequences and the measures taken to mitigate and adverse possible side effects. There is a notification to cover cause and effect and remedial action. They must communicate the details of the data protection officer to the supervisory authority. Failure to report within 72 hours must be explained and as I said before the European Data Protection Board has to provide th further clarification on the meaning of undue delay. There is an obligation for the data controller to communicate a personal data breach to data subject in certain circumstances. Again, it comes back to this high risk data 
communication is in a clear plain language, so no jargon. If the controller deems that this is not necessary, the supervisory authority can overrule the, da the data controller and compel them to communicate with the data subject. There are again exceptions if appropriate technical and organizational measures have been taken and the high risk to data subject will not materialize. Also there is a, an option to communicate with data subject where, where it would involve disproportionate effort. So what that means is if there's a relatively uh, medium uh, disclosure of information but to write to 10 million data subjects would be substantial effort. They can go the other way and perhaps um, make an announcement on the national news or, or using the internet to communicate with the data subject. Independent supervisory authority. Each member state must create an independent supervisory authority and resource them appropriately. I said earlier that the uh, uh, fines have been taken away, so that is a source of funding for them. Um, so there is a requirement in the regulation for them to be funded appropriately. Um, their tasks are monitor monitoring and enforcement, communication, promotion of awareness. They have powers ranging from investigatory, uh, corrective powers, advisory and enforcement powers. Um, where we have multi-state controllers, there will be a leading supervisory authority that will act for the multiple presence. The European Data Protection Board uh, ensures communication, consistency, mutual assistance across the national supervisory authorities, so they are looking to ensure consistency amongst the supervisory authorities, uh, monitor and ensure the correct application of the regulation, examine any question to deal with its application, so they are um, the authority that decides any conflicting decisions and ensure a level playing field across the 28 member states. So in summary, the GTPR is a complete overhaul of data protection framework in Europe, covers all forms of personally identifiable information, biometric data, genetic location, applies across all the member states, applies to all organisation processing data of European Union citizens, wherever those organisations are based. So wherever the organisation is based is largely material. There are specific rights of data subjects, obligations, controllers and processors, implementation of privacy by design, um, penalties for breach up to 4% of revenue, data subjects have the right to bring actions in their home state, they can also bring it where the controller is located or where in fact the breach was located. So there's, there's three areas that they can bring an action in. Fines take into account the technical and organizational measures that the organization has implemented. If you look at data breaches in the UK, because a lot of these numbers are, are hidden from the public generally, ja January to March 2016, there were 448 cases. The breaches by sector were 184 in health sector. Um, part of the reason for that is the mandatory reporting in the health sector in the United Kingdom. Uh, it's one of our biggest sectors uh, you know, in terms of size, the sensitivity of the data that is, is, is contained there and the distress and detriment that can be caused. Um, local government, there are large volumes of information, social care data for instance, Education, well obviously there's pupils, child data, pupils, disciplinary data. Um, the general business that you see there on the screen, well that's largely driven by an upturn in cyber attacks. In finance, customer finance data, fraudulent activities. And the legal sector, the issue with legal sector is large amounts of data in transit, if you think lawyers going back and forward all over the place carrying loads of case files um, and the potential for data breaches there. Okay, if we'll 
very briefly, data breaches by type. There, there are broken down there, there's even from the loss of theft of paperwork. Um, but what's quite interesting is the web page hacking, 39. Uh, so there's still a, quite a lot going on there that, that can actually be dealt with. Down the bottom, other principle seven failures are security incidents that cannot be categorized as one of the other types. A typical example would be um, failure to password protect emails containing personal information, processing personal data related to work on a non-business computer. So that is the type of thing that ISO 27001, for instance, when implemented, would implement controls to take care of uh, principle seven failures. Again, on cyber hacking, I mentioned that customer earlier that had 156,000 customers that were ultimately effect, affected by an attack, uh, and ultimately they had to make uh, a provision in their accounts for 83 million pounds, uh, exceptional charges to respond to the breach. Information security is very much about people, process, and technology and the interrelationship between those three areas. In terms of cyber security assurance, GDPR requirement controllers must implement appropriate technical and organizational measures. They must include appropriate data protection policies. They must approve to adhere to approved codes of conduct, and these are being developed at the moment. As you can see, that ICO and BSI are both developing new GDPR-focused standards. ISO 27001 already meets the appropriate technical and organizational measures. And that provides assurance to the board that data security is being managed in accordance with the regulation. I think I mentioned at the very start of this presentation that within the GRC group here at IT Governance, we talk from the board right down to operational level. Uh, and it's important that you have board uh, endorsement for these for these solutions. Uh, it helps manage all our information assets and all information security within the organization, protecting against all threats. IT governance is a one-stop shop, so we do a number of things from accredited training. We have a one-day foundation course for the GDPR. Um, we can either do it uh, London or Cambridge or at customer site or in fact we have an online option. We have a practitioner course. We also have a pocket guide. We have a full documentation toolkit for GDPR and we have a first class consultancy team who can do support on data audit, uh, cover everything from data mapping right through to gap analysis. That leaves us ready for questions. So if you'd like to answer questions or ask questions, please, that would be wonderful. OK, thank you, folks. The questions are coming in thick and fast here, so I'll take them one at a time. Um, right, first question, um, what about children? Um, children within the regulation are, there's quite a focus on children actually, and they are given a protected status. So along with health data, employment data, uh, criminal sanctions is going to be dealt with. There is an exemption to criminal data in the sense that the European Union um, or the functioning of the European Union to be more specific allows the uh, an exemption to, to to use criminal data to protect the citizens of the European Union. So that what that means is that you know if somebody has committed a crime, that data is freely available to all the law organisations across the European Union, but health data and children's data is not. How does the EU referendum result? change the landscape for the GDPR in the UK? Well, actually, our position is that it is no different. Um, any organization is irrespective of where the organization resides. It is about 
the data subjects in the European Union and their personally identifiable data. So anybody that processes that data or controls that data is has to um, subscribe to the regulation. So it doesn't matter where they reside. In fact, they could, you know, the United States, um, wherever. And in fact, there's quite a bit of detail on in the regulation on what they call establishment. Um, so that talks about where the controller resides, um, in which country, whether they reside outside the European Union, and in certain circumstances they have to appoint an agent within the European Union. The agent has to reside where that controller does most of their processing, and there has to be a clear defined uh, structure between the agent, the processor, and the controller, right up to the supervisory authority. So let me see what other questions we've got. Did I cover Brexit? I hope so. What's the meaning of third country? Right, a third country, the, 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 in European law there are various levels of exchange of information internationally. Uh, in the first instance we have what's called the European Economic Area, which are currently the 27, sorry my fault, 28 member states. I'm preempting the UK <laughs> there, um, but also there are other countries like Norway, Liechtenstein, uh, that make up the list. I think about 31, and that's called the European Economic Area. So at the moment, in terms of transferring data between those countries, there is no uh, extra special legal requirements, other than the principles that we talked about earlier have to be observed. When you go outside the European Union, there are a further list of approved countries. Canada and New Zealand are on the list. Uh, United States is not at the moment. And there we get into what we the discussions about safe harbor, which is currently invalid. And uh, then there are other countries. There are other mechanisms for transferring data. There are a mechanism called model clauses. Uh, that can be used, or there's another mechanism called binding corporate rules. Binding corporate rules are typically used where you have a, a multinational organization. So I'll give you an example, uh, an, an organization like British Petroleum that operates in a number of different countries throughout the world. Um, British Petroleum can use binding model clauses to pass sensitive personnel data between these locations. Uh, kind of like an intranet, I would guess, is probably the, the best way to explain it. Um, and they have to protect their staff. I'm just looking at the questions. Will the DPO be a protected role in the United Kingdom? Um, the, D the DPO, that's a data processing officer, will be a protected role throughout the European Union. Um, there are certain uh, recommendations, if you like, uh, one of them is organizations with more than 250 employ employees should appoint a data protection officer, and um, you are correct, it is in fact a protected role. Uh, they have direct access to senior management, uh, board of directors, uh, the organization has to give the data protection officer the resources available to do their role, in addition to which um, for a corporate organization that has uh, subsidiaries, they can share a data protection officer as long as the role is not compromised. So very important role going forward is a data protection officer. Okay, looking at some other questions. Professional services companies stand to make a lot of money stepping in to help organizations investigate data breaches. Do you think there's an increased requirement for digital for digital forensic skills in-house? And should organizations have a data breach investigator to support the data protection officer? Right, let me try and break that one down. Um, Professional services companies stand to make a lot of money. I would agree with that. I think what we're seeing is um, a lot of the professional services company now really gearing up um, to offer their skills to uh, organizations. I think the way to deal with data breaches, 
is under the old regulation there was what there was what's called a privacy impact assessment that's now been quite revised under the the new regulation because what we have now is a data processing impact impact assessment and what the what that means is that under the old directive the pro, the focus was pretty much on the data under the new regulation the focus is as much on processing as it is on the data but even more than that when we talk about privacy by design there are I think there's about 46 references in the regulation to a risk-based approach to data security and what that means is effectively that whenever any organization is going to change its processing or the way it operates whether it's cross division or between countries a risk assessment will, will be required to be undertaken that risk assessment should it should the uh, processing go wrong and the organization fall foul of the supervisory authority that risk assessment will be taken into mitigation um, or considered in mitigating circumstances um, clearly organizations that change processes uh, the way that they work and don't do risk assessments or DPIAs data processing impact assessments um, will find it more difficult to deal with the supervisory authorities and that will be reflected in fines um, do you think there's an increased requirement for digital forensic skills in-house? Um, I think we're all going to have to be more diligent. I think uh, you know the world is becoming is more complicated. It's not getting less complicated as we move forward. Um, and I think uh, you know there are other laws coming out of Europe to do with uh, network transmission of personal data. Uh, these will have to be taken into account as well, but yeah, I think organizations of any size are going to have to have specialists in-house um, and in fact, you know, fairly substantial organization may well have a data protection officer and a team behind that. One more question, I think we've got time for one more. Did I say there would be a standard and certification from either ICO or BSI? One of the things that um, they talk about in the regulation is codes of conduct, um, and they talk about it in the context, or you know, broadly, but also within sector. And what they mean by that is, for instance, financial services would be a good example. That within the financial services sector, there will be codes of conduct and organizations are expected to comply with those codes of conduct. Um, I know in the oil and gas industry, which is one of my areas of specialism, there are you know, uh, associations and um, organizations that you know, talk about and, and, and set standards and the way things are done and the GDPR sets out that it expects all organizations in all sectors to comply with codes of conduct. Now going across the way they're talking about things like privacy seals, um, trust seals and the development and I think IC and BSI are already working on those with, in conjunction with um, the Information Commissioner's Office at the moment. So those are, those regulate, those codes of conduct go across and they go up and down as well. So I'd just like to thank everyone for the time. We're now coming to the end of this webinar. I hope you found it useful. As I said earlier, the slides will be going out to each of you tomorrow morning from our support team. Um, our contact details will on there, so if you need any further information, you can contact us, and we wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.